It's so primitive. These conceptions, this idea that identity is your choice is such... Identity isn't your choice when you're three years old on a playground for the first time. Mm. Identity is negotiated with other people, which even the bloody social constructionists admit the idea that it's a whim, that it's something you choose on the basis of your personal, uh, of, of a personal feeling is, it really, it's, it's that level of, of understanding is approximately the developmental level of a two-year-old. And, and I mean that technically, because generally <laughs> two-year-olds aren't capable of, of putting themselves in someone else's place, or they're not as capable as they will be. Yeah. And so the idea that you can just impose your identity on me is, that's completely insane. We negotiate our identities with other people all the time. Well, th- this is actually something I've been uh, I've been mulling over as well. It the, the the idea of gender roles, and I haven't really fully formulated this thought process yet. But since I've got you, I thought I'd run it by you. Um, I don't understand how they can claim there are more than two genders because, as far as I can tell, gender is like a handshake. You know, it's it's a it's a series of cues and signals. For example, like. If you know, if I if I take a lady out to dinner, I'll pull the chair out so she can sit down. She knows what she's supposed to do because there's a, there's an understanding from just previous context of our lives. But and if I don't say pull the chair out and, and she's expecting me to do so, then I fail. I, you know, she she may well be like effectively holding out her hand to be shaken, and I'm not taking the hand and shaking it. And so they for them to unilaterally say right, okay, the, there are thousands of genders. And, and genders are all social construct. They're all performative in nature. They're they're all you know everyone's basically a tabula rasa, and they can just choose whichever they want. It's obviously not true, because I mean, if I don't it, like, it's not like say it's a two way street. It's if I don't know what I'm supposed to do with someone who identifies as a demi girl or whatever, you know, just pick a random made up gender that they've got. If if I don't know what the process around that is then we don't have a gender interaction. We don't okay, have okay. a handshake. Okay, so, so, so while well, you put your finger on an essential weakness in the philosophy, it's like, first of all, the idea that gender identity is independent of biological sex is, is insane. Yeah, it's it's wrong. It's, it's wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. that The scientific data are, they're not only clear, they're clear beyond dispute. It, it's as bad as claiming that the world is flat, in my estimation. <laughs> now, having said that, there are masculine women and there are feminine men. If you look at temperament, for example, mm-hmm. so on average, men are less agreeable and lower in neuroticism than women, and so they're lower in negative emotion and they're lower in compassion and empathy. They're more they're more competitive. Now the differences there aren't massive. So, for example, if you take a random man and a random woman from the population and you guessed that the woman was more agreeable than the man, you'd be right 60% of the time, but wrong 40%. Yeah. And if you took a random man and a random woman out of the population and you guessed that the woman was more agreeable than the man, you'd be wrong 40% of the time. So there's a lot of overlap. And so you can have men with quite feminine temperaments and women with quite masculine temperaments. But that, but, but they still have all sorts of other differences that characterize sure. them. Okay, now, yeah, so, just one so there age. is biological grounding. There is variability. And then there is a sociological element, which is what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. But, and so... So, but what you put your finger on is the, and this is something the damn postmodernists agree among themselves, is that, okay, let's say that gender is performative. All right, so that makes it into a kind of agreed upon social game. Hmm. But that's the thing, it's an agreed upon social game. Yeah. You don't identify, you don't adopt the role because it suits how you feel. You adopt the role so that you can use it as a tool to maneuver with in society. I mean, that's why the, the transsexual guys often become out as extraordinarily feminine. You know, they wear dresses, yeah. they wear high heels, they put on makeup. None of that's biologically instantiated, or, or if it is, it's, it's only to a limited degree. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but they adopt those rules because people know how to play the game. Yeah. And so the thing about identity is that identity is a, is a set of tools that you use to operate with in the world. And if those tools don't function, you don't have a, a functional identity. Well, yeah. It isn't just something yeah. that you put on because you feel that way. It has to be something that other people know how to respond to, or you will become completely alienated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost a way of deliberately alienating other people, because 
Uh, like you said, it's, a, it's an agreed upon set of rules. And if you come in and say, right, I've got a new set of rules and I don't, none of you have agreed to any of these rules. You don't even know what they are, but I'm going to demand that you operate by my standard anyway. I mean, it's hard not to see that as a method of controlling other people. It, it is precisely that. It's narcissistic to the core. And, and she's expecting me to do so. Then I fail. I, you know, she, she may well be like effectively holding out her hand to be shaken and I'm not taking the hand and shaking it. And so they, for them to unilaterally say, right, okay, the, there are thousands of genders and, and genders are all social construct. They're all performative in nature. They're, they're all, you know, everyone's basically a tabula rasa and they can just choose whichever they want. It's obviously not true because i mean if i don't it, like it's not like say it's a two-way street it's if i don't know what i'm supposed to do with someone who identifies as a demi girl or whatever you know to pick a random made-up gender that they've got if if i don't know what the process around that is then we don't have a gender interaction we don't okay, have okay. a handshake okay so 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 while you put your woman was more agreeable than the man you'd be right 60 percent of the time but wrong 40 percent yeah. And if you took a random man and a random woman out of the population and you guessed that the woman was more agreeable than the man, you'd be wrong 40% of the time. So there's a lot of overlap. And so you can have men with quite feminine temperaments and women with quite masculine temperaments. But that, but, but they still have all sorts of other differences that characterize sure. them. Okay, now, yeah, so, so there is biological grounding. There is variability. And then there is a sociological element, which is what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But, and so... So, but what you put your finger on is the, and this is something the damn postmodernists agree among themselves, is that, okay, let's say that gender is performative. All right, so that makes it into a, it's so primitive. These conceptions, this idea that identity is your choice is such, identity isn't your choice when you're three years old on a playground for the first time. Hmm. Identity is negotiated with other people, which even the bloody social constructionists admit the idea that it's a whim, that it's something you choose on the basis of your personal, uh, of, of a personal feeling, is, it really, it's, it's that level of, of understanding is approximately the developmental level of a two-year-old. And, and I mean that technically, because <laughs> generally two-year-olds aren't capable of, of putting themselves in someone else's place, or they're not as capable as they will be finger on an essential weakness in the philosophy it's like first of all the idea that gender identity is independent of biological sex is is insane yeah it's, it's wrong <laughs> it's, it's wrong mm -hmm. that the scientific data are they're not only clear they're clear beyond dispute it, it's as bad as claiming that the world is flat in my estimation <laughs> now having said that there are masculine women and there are feminine men if you look at temperament for example mm -hmm. so on average, men are less agreeable and lower in neuroticism than women. And so they're lower in negative emotion and they're lower in compassion and empathy. They're more, they're more competitive. Now, the differences there aren't massive. So, for example, if you take a random man and a random woman from the population and you guess that the... Yeah. So the idea that you can just impose your identity on me is... That's completely insane. We negotiate our identities with other people all the time. Well, th this is actually something I've been uh, I've been mulling over as well. It the, the the idea of gender roles, and I haven't really fully formulated this thought process yet. But since I've got you, I thought I'd run it by you. Um, I don't understand how they can claim there are more than two genders because, as far as I can tell, gender is like a handshake. You know, it's it's a it's a series of cues and signals. For example, like. If you know, if I if I take a lady out to dinner, I'll pull the chair out so she can sit down. She knows what she's supposed to do because there's a, there's an understanding from just previous context of our lives. But and if I don't say pull the chair out, and well, it is a controversial topic on a Toronto University campus this month. Some people on the campus saying pronouns like he, she, him, or her do not represent them accurately. Now, the university wants staff to use alternate pronouns, but Jordan Peterson is a psychology professor at the university, and he is refusing to do that. Take a look at this. The reason I'm defending freedom of speech is because that's how people with different opinions settle their opinions in a civil society. Peterson! 
Gentlemen, do you have any comments on the Nazi presence at your protest? The presence of Nazis and white supremacists assaulting people at your protest. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I don't like Nazis. I'm speaking out the way I'm speaking out because I think this is a route to no violence. And violence is lurking. And you can say that that sounds like a threat. There was no violence at our protest, though. I was just ask, would you refer to me, if it wasn't for this law, and I asked you to refer to me with they, them pronouns, would you? And your answer was no. Not if I was compelled to. So just an example of how things uh, have become heated at the University of Toronto. That scene showing different groups of students, some confronting the professor about his position, others supporting him. Now, Peterson says this is about free speech, but A.W. Pete is also a professor at the University of Toronto who says that Peterson's language is abusive. Joining us right now is Professor Jordan Peterson as well as Professor A.W. Pete. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Uh, Professor Peterson, let's begin with you. Uh, why are you against the use of alternate pronouns? I'm, not, I'm against the use of, of le legislation to determine what words are that myself and other people are required to utter. But would you use alternate pronouns if a student asked you to? I think I've made my position on that clear already. Well, perhaps not to our audience at home who are just being introduced to this. Would you use alternate no. pronouns? And why not? I, because I don't want and anyone can answer it. Okay. And then the answers get upvoted. Wow. So, yeah, it's quite an interesting site and many people use it. And so a kid wrote in and, and asked if anybody knew some good rules for living. And so I wrote 42 rules for living and posted it on Quora and it, it became very popular. Hundreds of thousands of people read it. Wow. And, and then I was talking to a book agent in Canada who had recommended that I write a more popular book. And so I decided to turn a number of those rules for living into essays. And so the book is a, a set of rules for living. Wow. So that means that it also will give us some, uh, some uh, essays about the coming out, pushing our borders. Yes, exactly, definitely, and, it, and the essays the essays circulate around the sorts of topics that we were talking about today, and so Super. and so that's what that book will be. And then, well, uh, we talked a little earlier about this. I also have these writing programs online at a site called selfauthoring.com. Yeah. Perfect. We, we've given away a number of those lately. The yeah. future authoring program, um, and that helps people write a plan for their life. And well, one of them helps people write hmm. an autobiography. The other helps them. The present one helps people analyze their personality and the future authoring program helps them write a plan for their life three to five years down the road. And it helps them develop a vision of what their life would be like if they were taking care of themselves as if they were someone they, they wanted the best for. Hmm. And so you write about what your life would be like three to five years down the road if, if things turned out for you in a manner that would be good for you. Mm. And then you write for 15 minutes about what your life could be like in three to five years if all your bad habits and and careless thinking and, and resentments and so forth took the upper hand and drove you into the ground. And so that what that does is it, it, help, it gives some people a concrete sense of of why effort is useful because it moves them towards a valued goal mm. and it moves them away from a terrible place and that way you're sort of maximally motivated because if you really want to be maximally motivated you want to be trying to get away from someone something terrible mm. while you're simultaneously moving towards something better mm. i think it's partly why many religious structures have a conception of heaven and hell mm. and because heaven is that place where things are optimally configured and hell is that place where everything falls apart mm. worse than everything falling apart it's a place where everything falls apart and makes you bitter and resentful and and then well and then mm. dangerous and then maybe even worse than dangerous and so after you write out positive and negative vision you write out a detailed plan for attaining your positive vision including articulating the reasons that you're pursuing it and why it would be good for you and why it would be good for your family and why it would be good for society and what you do if if obstacles emerge and 
We've done that with now with about 7,000 university students, mostly in Holland, as it turns out. I have a collaborator there who's been very active in testing this process. And we've improved people's university performance by about 20, 20 to 25 percent and dropped their dropout rate by about 20 to 25 percent. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, that's you know, amazing. It, works best, it works best for um, for males mm. who are now underperforming females in, in many academic institutions. And it works even better for minorities students. So, and I, I think it's because minority students, immigrants students, they have a harder time with their math eh, because mm -hmm. they're, they're not enculturated. And so having them walk through a detailed plan for their life seems to have amazing effects on their performance. So that's so cool. It isn't something we expected. I, would try well, I didn't expect the program to work as well as it did. <laughs> I, I bought all of them, and I think ah. it, and I think it's amazing because it brings it brings this awareness. It brings awareness, and you see you see your traits and not that the not that traits. The, yeah. And what I think is great about it is that when you start asking the question, asking answering these questions, is that it brings the awareness of why I'm here, what yeah. stopped me from attaining my goal, and what's yeah. the, what's the traits I've been having since I was five, for example. So it brings this, uh, this awareness, and just to round it up now, Jordan, is that around almost 40% of everything we do every day is on automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's what science says. Uh, so this means that uh, your program is bringing the awareness to this 40%, actually. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, one of the things that I've learned, too, in my clinical practice is, like, people are aiming for something, whether they know it or not. That's something I learned from reading Carl Jung. Mm. He said that you're acting out a myth whether you know it or not. So you're aiming at something whether you know it or not. And yeah. you you may have picked up your aims from all sorts of places that you're not really consciously aware of. Your parents' demands and their parents' demands and cultural demands and your own resentments and impulses. And they all go together to make a value structure and, and that orients you. But it's it's better to think through and articulate your own value structure. And that's partly because one of the reasons that people don't get what they need and want in life is because they don't aim at it. Mm. They, think, they, think, they think they aim at it, but they don't. Well, or, or sometimes they won't even, they won't even, they haven't even taken the time to articulate out their goals, partly sometimes because, well, it's difficult to mm. decide what you want. But I think people are often afraid too that if they do, See, the problem with making your goals clear is that you also make your conditions for failure more clear. Mm. That actually turns out to be a good thing, mm. but it's scary mm. because if you're vague and, and, and unclear about what you're after, then you can hide failure from yourself. And so people are perfectly willing to keep themselves enveloped in a kind of fog of unknowing mm. because it protects them against the felt sense of failure, but it completely eradicates the probability that they'll get what they would need and want in in life hmm. so it's very very counterproductive and that's the reason i think this program is essential because i think we need we need to bring this awareness and i work i work as a mental trainer or mind trainer and i yes. see that most of most of the problems is the unawareness so what i'm working the most with is asking questions asking questions yeah, brings I, awareness so Absolutely. That's well, that's why those programs are mostly questions. Yeah, that's the reason I started this podcast was was to ask people with success or that's done something unique to see what their mechanisms is, what their strategies yeah. are. And when they, when we ask these questions, we start to think. We stop this automatic reaction when we get this question of why what's what's the reason you you did that action, for example, or what's the benefit or outcome you want out out of your action now. So okay. when you start right. to think about the outcome of the action, you start to become aware of it. And we yeah. start to do this for every action. You start to think, ah, oh, that's the reason I'm yes. doing this. And that is not the way I want to go. So Right. Well, so, that's the critical thing. And, and it's very useful to do that with your relationships, too. Mm. You know, I mean, one thing that people can do that's very helpful if, if you have a, a partner is to decide what, what you want from them. Mm. And you can always discuss that with them. I mean, there's there's always the possibility that if you're clear about what you want, 
assuming that you're vaguely reasonable and that you're willing to negotiate, that the other person is willing to meet your demands, you know, assuming that you're also willing to engage in the same process with them. Mm. But if you do your partner a great favor by letting you letting them know in quite a bit of detail what would actually make you happy. Mm. And people people won't do that either. They expect they think something like, well, if my partner loved me, they'd know what I want. That's, <laughs> that's not you know, true. That's, that is definitely not true. Just, yeah, yeah, but it's it's amazing how many people act that out. Yeah, I and know. The consequences are very negative. And it's all about awareness. The reason mm -hmm. when we start. Yeah, well, right. One of the one of the stories that I've been very entranced by. Two of them. One is a story from ancient Mesopotamia called the Enuma Elish, and the other is a story from ancient Egypt about a god named Horus. And the characteristic of both those gods, those are both gods who encounter chaos and, and make order. So they, they go outside their boundary of comfort and, and regenerate the world, really. Mm. And the Mesopotamian god Marduk, he's described as having eyes all the way around his head. And the Egyptian god Horus is the famous Egyptian eye that pays attention. Mm. And, you know, talking about awareness and both the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians worshipped awareness and attention as the highest god. Okay. Yeah, and they regarded the, the Mesopotamians regarded awareness and attention as hmm. part of the process that turns chaos into habitable order. So that turns uncertainty into certainty and turns unexplored territory into explored territory. That makes sense. Yeah, and then the Egyptians regarded the the Horus, who's who's a falcon, and also the eye, hmm. as the force that regenerates the dying society. Same same idea, you know, and and that its attention moves outside the world of the known, encounters new things, get, encounters new and frightening things, gathers information as a consequence, and then restructures the world. Hmm. And that's what human beings are supposed to do. That's what we find meaningful. And that is actually what YouTubing is doing these days. It's bringing this awareness. We start seeing what is wrong and what's not wrong, and what we can do and not what to do. Yes, yes. And I mean, I, 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 in Maps of Meaning, I, I laid out an argument that was derived partly from Nietzsche. And Nietzsche believed that because of the death of our most fundamental presuppositions, he called that the death of God, mm. that Western society had been cast into a situation where both nihilism and meaninglessness and totalitarianism beckoned as alternatives. Because mm. if your meaning structure falls apart, it's easy to become nihilistic. And if your meaning structure falls apart, it's easy to turn to a totalitarian solution. Mm. And so then the question is, what's is there an alternative to those two? And Carl Jung worked on that a lot, and I worked on that a lot when I was writing Maps of Meaning, and the conclusion that I derived from all the reading I had done in the investigation was that the proper solution to the fact that things have fallen apart is to build individual character mm. not to become nihilistic and not to become totalitarianism not totalitarian not to become the member of a group that's right about everything but to build your own individual character so that you can forthrightly encounter the unknown and and regenerate the map your map and, and the general map the general map that people use which is society and you're really doing this these days with your uh, YouTube videos. Well, it looks it looks like it. <laughs> it's pretty interesting that they're able to have such reach. I think it's, I think it's amazing. It is amazing. It's absolutely amazing, and and it's so it's so interesting that discussions and lectures now have the same reach as books or mm. more reach. Even that's a technological revolution. Uh, it's marvelous. For sure, I can talk to you for hours, George, but I think you're a busy man. I just want one last question. If you want to recommend a book, what book would that be? Well, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, that's a pretty good book. Mm. And it's, it's, it's a nice intro to what I would think of as both sophisticated philosophy and sophisticated psychology that deals with very weighty issues. But it, for people who are who are interested in meaning and, and interesting interested in having a, a more productive and, and engaging life, Man's Search for Meaning is a great book. Mm. Ah, it's marvelous. It's, it's perfect. Thank you so much for your time, Jordan. And I hope to see you further on YouTube. 
with more lectures. My my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so